Where are you actually? I'm located in Denver. Uh, whereabouts are you? I'm in Washington, D.C. Nice. I like Washington. I have friends there. I have friends there. Just moved from New York City after 35 years. Whoa. Is that a big shock to the system? No, I, I grew up here. So it's, it's, it's kind of nice to be away from New York, frankly. I've never been to New York. Um, no. I want to go, but uh, my daughter's probably going to go before me. She, uh, I think for their, the kids' 16th birthdays, the grandparents take them on a trip anywhere in the Great 48 they want to go. Oh, nice. And um, she picked New York City, and now I'm jealous because... I'm not going to New York. So. Oh, that's so funny. I know. So what's your background then? What what brings you to Hoopileo? Oh, sure. Um, so I, uh, I I know Liesl Perez for one thing. She's our uh, vice president of marketing communications. She and I actually worked together at a, a global BPO company. Um, I, I was uh, managing social media there for our talent acquisition team. And I managed like eight different people. We were global. We were pretty much on multiple, multiple, multiple social media accounts all the time, 24-7. Um, but I also do live streaming. I did, I hosted a live stream show for them. Um, and, uh, I, I done podcasting and stuff like that. So she, we both went, went on to other, other, uh, job moves and she accepted a position with Hublot. And we, it was funny because I went to her house and we were just, uh, it, it was her last day at our former company. And she just was like telling me what she was doing. And I was like, Oh my gosh, well, if you ever need somebody, she's just like, really? And I was like, Oh, uh, I don't know. Cause I, I was happy at another role. I was doing content marketing and we just got talking and here we are. So now I'm managing their social media, uh, also doing our live streaming and podcasting. And we're going to reboot our podcast. They had go, uh, Hublot had going last, uh, winter, I think. So mm -hmm. you are my first full podcast interview for oh, that reboot. Yeah, Do you I feel awesome? I feel, yeah. And how, and how, what's going to be the reach of it? Um, well, we'll see because I, uh, I think the um, it, I think they got it going, but it didn't have a whole lot of push. And I don't know if they were really pr uh, promoting it a whole lot. I am going to promote the crud out of this thing. Okay. And really, well, and I really want to, A, I'm a huge believer in podcasts. Um, you know, I, I just know their power and, and just the organic reach of them. And that's something we really believe in at Hubelo. We know that there's community. I mean, I'm sure I'm preaching the choir here because, you know, but um, we, we just want to we want to showcase these voices, but also provide a resource. And podcast is a great way to do that. Plus, um, recording this, we'll get it up as um, podcast episodes. But I'm also going to um, be editing some of the video segments. Of this. this is why we're both on video so that we can also push this out on our live stream. But all with the goal of saying, hey, if you want to hear the in-depth interview, go listen to our podcast. So. Are you yeah. using, I'm using the greatest editing tool ever. You Tell me. Descript? No. Uh, it. Write it down. D-E-S-C-R-I-P-T. Okay. It's changed my life like we wouldn't believe. Nice. It basically allows you to um, edit podcasts and video using the word processing. No. So, yeah. So basically what you do is you upload the entire audio thing that you recorded. And it enables you to get rid of the ums and the ahs in a minute and a half, uh, 30 seconds or 10 seconds. It gets you to, um, you can you can edit, you can just cut out a word and it and it does the cutting. Oh. Video and audio. Sh I'm totally going to look that yeah, up. It is life changing. I use, um, I, I did some podcasting with a, a friend of mine, a colleague or peer in the social media, and he uh, got me a... Uh, uh, Mm, it's the name of the big, it, it's a terrible name because it's the name of the big blimp that, that blew up in a fire, the Hindenburg. The Hindenburg, it's called the Hindenburg? It's okay. called Hindenburg. Uh, but for podcast editing, it's fabulous because it is the same kind of thing where you can drop it in and it automatically adjusts all the, um, all the uh, audio peaks and things like that. But uh, I like that. I've used Adobe Audition before and I do have, like I use Adobe oh, Premiere, yeah. I can do all that stuff. But man, these this days is, when you can do it faster. This is a life changer. I'm trying I to want my life changed. Yeah, this is this is a life changer. It is definitely a life changer. I use it for everything. And also, you can create these 30-second little audio clips oh. that you can use for social media on uh, on Instagram and everything else. I'm totally going to be asking Liesl for uh, some budget for this. Yeah, it's not expensive <laughs> either. It's like 90 oh. bucks a month. It's like nothing. That's nothing. Oh, my gosh. Anything that helps me work smarter instead of harder, I'm a big yeah. fan of. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, definitely. Uh, I'm using it for everything. I'm able to turn stuff around in a minute, like oh. in a flash. So it's great. Um, and when you can do that with video and audio editing, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. It's a big. That deal. stuff takes so much time. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, shall okay. we? Um, shall yeah, we get so what, started? And um, yeah, what do you want? What do you want to do as the topics? I have a. I've just been 
I just wrote a new paper that I'm working on called It's Coming, The Great Event Industry Ren Renaissance. Ooh, you know, I like that. It's really kind of interesting. And so I've got a whole bunch of points that. that could... Well, let's um, let's do that because I'll when we as we kind of get going here and I will do like a little snaps just so I know the audio start of it. But um, uh, I'll ask you some kind of intro questions that are really just a little bit more to get know, get a little know, get to know a little bit more about you. But okay. I'll segue and say, so, you know. David, we were getting together here today to talk about kind of the state of the events industry, but I know you have some specific things in mind, and I'd love to hear kind of what you're working on right now related to like what you're seeing. And then if you want to usher into the right. Renaissance thing, and we will just talk about it from there, if that works. That, that sounds great. Sweet. All right. So I will uh, just do this little lovely snap. Okay. And that is kicking off our thing. So um, again, I will edit this all over the place, but um. Hey everyone, uh, Rachel with Hubelo, and I'm happy to be joined here today with our guest, uh, David Adler from BizBash. Now I can say your name, David, and your business name and your all that stuff, but I think there's so much more to you. And um, if you don't mind, introduce yourself a little bit, but then I want to ask you some questions about yourself. But can you introduce yourself to our, our listening and follower audience? Absolutely. Uh, so I am, as you did, you got that right, David Adler. That was the name I was born with, no stage name. <laughs> <laughs> we want to know about those too. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't have any of those. Um, but I think now, you know, when you do uh, have a name of a person, you have to think of what the URL of that person will be. That's so right. It's really hard to like name somebody like John Smith you have or really Rachel think, Moore. That's a hard Rachel one. Too. Moore. <laughs> it's a hard URL because you're never, you got to like, you have to change it a little bit. So I don't know if that'll happen anymore, but that's that, at least in the, in the, uh, the 2000, this, this century, we're worrying about that little stuff. So I basically have been the uh, the CEO of a company called BizBash for the last 20 years. Uh, we, we have celebrated our anniversary. We started uh, right before 9-11. We mm. went through the dot bomb. We went through uh, the recession. We went through all the different things that you could possibly go to do. Doing businesses in the last 20 years was like being an outward bound for the business world. Right. And it was one big uh, survival uh, test. <laughs> um, but, but what we do at BizBash is we cover events and create a database of who did what at the event so that event planners are able to peek over the fence to see what other people are doing. Because for years, you can never see what another event organizer was doing. And as event organizing got more and more and more important, it became more important than ever to make sure that you're upping the bar so that you mm -hmm. don't, you know what your competition's about. So we basically created a, a physical, a visual vehicle for people to see ideas and to get ideas and to expand on ideas and to find out who did the stuff. And it, uh, it's been fantastic over the last 20 years. And now people are doing that now in the digital world too, because mm -hmm. everyone wants to know, oh, how did you do that? You know, we just had a discussion on uh, on new technology that we were for editing, which you know we're geeked out. That's over. right. That's so right. No, it, there's so much to geek out about, and it's kind of wild that you're keeping track of all of that. I'm, my mind's a little blown by how much work yep. that must take. It takes a lot of work. We've had it. We've had. Uh, we have a huge staff of people. Uh, in J December 2019, I sold 80 percent of the company to a company called Tarsus, mm. uh, who is uh, continuing that and taking it more global. Uh, because they have, they're all around the world, um, like Kubilo, and uh, it uh, it's going to be a really interesting ride to see what they're going to do. Because the one thing about events, it's kind of like the music business; it, it travels internationally. Mm -hmm. Everyone is doing the same thing. Gathering human gathering is not going to be different uh, that much, you know, fundamentally in every part of the world. You know, you're you're going to get together, you're going to talk, you're going to do s things that you may do in your own world, but it all blends together eventually. And you want to make sure that it's uh, it's cool and it's fun and it, you yeah. remember it and it's not boring and you're not wasting your time. Oh, no. Yeah. We were just talking about that, too. No one wants to waste their time. And you know what? I'm kind of I'm envisioning your I'm envisioning biz bash is almost like if anyone remembers that uh, Tim Allen uh, show um, what was that uh, the one where he's like the Tim, the tool man, Taylor. And he had the neighbor in the backyard that he always ever just saw his eyes just kind of peeking over the fence. So I feel like you're like BizBash is, uh, is that guy peeking over the fence. And everyone right now listening is yelling that I'm not I don't know his name. I think it's Wilson. Um, but yeah, where you just always have that eye on like, OK, what's happening in your yard? Let me yeah, just well, I'm just. You know, when you think about it, that's what journalism was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, now, everyone's a journalist, uh, but yeah. you have a certain expertise, I think, when you when you get to know a field really well. 
mm-hmm. and you get to see it for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, it's, it just, it's, it's been fascinating for me because, yeah. you know, I started out, uh, the first thing I did out of college is I, I'm a startup guy. I started a society newspaper magazine for Washington, DC. First month I graduated college, I started a society magazine. And for some reason it was out in, in black tie every night and people thought I was a maitre d' uh, because <laughs> I was at parties every night. And I, and it was, it was really interesting endeavor. I started it on $6,000. I hired my mother to be the editor and we would just go to cocktail parties and cover it and create a database of, of who did what in Washington, who the power players were. And then when I was working for a big corporation, I realized that this event industry is kind of, it's, it's a version of what I call soft power. Mm-hmm. It's so, it, because what, you know, going to an event is a way to do reconnaissance and to hear what other people are thinking and to get the serendipity effect. So it's kind of like going out on a mission in a sense. It's not like war, but it is kind of like war when you think about it. And, and going to an event is like going into the front lines. Yeah. And uh, so it's more important than ever. Everything, you know, events are, are a way that we gather uh, and see what other people are doing. Well, such a, and it's such an interesting, um, you know, exercise in, in human psychology too. I mean, gosh, and, and again, I love that you're talking about this too, because I don't, I don't have time. I don't have time to go to every event and go judge it. I mean, if I was getting paid as a journalist to say, Hey, I want you to go to literally every event you can, and then write on that stuff, you know, just the takeaways, what you saw. Sure. And that's what you're basically doing. And, and that's so, that's so valuable because yes, all of us, we're not at war, but we definitely are in a very strong competition to put on the best event out there. And uh, heck, yeah, if I could learn from what somebody else did and well, said, hey, that yeah. worked over there. The event, think, you got to think of the event space as the battlefield. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're taking and you're, you're going to meet one company, you're going to meet people from another company and you're going to see what they are doing and hear about the little secrets and then go back and say, hey, boss. Hey, guess what I heard last night at this event? Because it's the only way to really do it legitimately. Yeah, you can go online, but that's you know that's just another way of doing it. Exactly, so it's primary research in a sense when you think about it. And, it, nice. and you think about it, what you know, the word gossip is also that too. Mm-hmm. People want to know, like, oh, what are these guys doing, and what are they wearing, and like, and, 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 <laughs> oh, that that nice new ring that woman got. Maybe she's engaged. You know, that's I mean. that's right. Well, and let's let's not kid ourselves. Everybody's talking about that stuff still too. I mean, I I've been on stage at a at a couple of you know our events that we host too with Hubelo, and you know I do put a lot of thought. I'm like, okay, I got to make sure because I'm sure somebody's gonna have an opinion about my makeup or about my hair or about like jewelry. I mean, all that's still interplaying there, mixed in with the rest of, of everything you're experiencing at an event. And uh, it's so, but I love that we're getting there's there's a database so. As somebody who's really interested in the tracking of information and knowing that it's happening and, you know, having mixed feelings about how much is getting tracked and how much isn't, knowing that this is happening for the events industry is is fascinating to me. And, of course, you w- I want all the information. So I'm glad that you're here with us today to uh, talk about that. <laughs> and we, you know, it's so funny. We grew to being the largest website for event organizers to get the style side of the business Mm -hmm. Uh, rather than, you know, anybody can figure out, you know, how much alcohol it takes to get like 300 people (laughs) drunk off their ass, but you know, (laughs) to make it, you know, memorable forever, it's, you know, that that you've hired this event designer and they did that. And like, do you remember, I mean, sometimes it's so funny, even on the personal wedding side, people will talk about their personal events for the, for the, they have a wedding and 50 years later, they're saying, oh my God, you remember that what we did at my wedding? Totally. We this great sculpture and they did this, blah, blah, blah. People, it, 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 it's, it's a way of engaging people that, that doesn't happen in other types of things. Yeah. I, I love that you said that too, because it is, I mean, it gets back to that experience of things where sure. I mean, and I even think about how people spend money nowadays. Like you could buy things or you, do you want to buy experiences? And if people are investing their time and money into going to an experience and you send them away where they're going to be talking about it, whether it's next week, next month, next year, five years from now or beyond for any event planner out there. I mean, when you have that memorability from what you just provided an attendee, you, you achieved it. You, you did your job. I mean, that's what you want. Um, you know, all the different things that come out of events that we do have goals about, but that lasting experience, because people, as you mentioned, they're going to talk about it. And that means you're going to get, be able to just succeed more and more at your events. But I, I love that you bring that whole, it is just like a wedding where I think all of us would love to put on events that are like those epic weddings sure. that nobody will, nobody will forget. So the one thing that I always, uh, whenever I speak on events, I always bring it back to 
the best event organizers I know are the the directors that did summer camps in the oh. 70s and 60s and I don't even the 80s and 90s. And, and But if you have a summer camp experience, you know what I'm thinking about. Mm-hmm. You know that there's something that they do on a regular basis that makes you want to come back. And sometimes these high-powered conferences are nothing more than reinventing summer camp. <laughs> You or you wish they were. Oh my gosh. You wish they were. Some of them are horrible. But the <laughs> idea is that you want that feeling that, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to sing that song and you're going to get goosebumps, you know. You know yes. And, uh, and so, so, so the idea is to how do you create intimacy at events and, and make them feel, you know, basically people are, are selling, you know, memories in many mm-hmm. cases. Yeah. So remember it. And also when you remember it, it sticks. And then you make buying decisions and you make relationship decisions and you make right. ideation decisions and you, it, there's something about it that, that you can see it on their face. There's an oxytocin exchange uh, that happens in events that usually it's the chemical between moms and kids, but it really happens everywhere. Yeah. And there's also, when you think about events, you think about it, the social physics of how ideas flow because ideas flow in ways, almost the way the virus is working. You know, when you think about it, like people are there having these viruses and uh, and you see how, you know, ideas flow in the same way. That's what I learned recently, that, that when you think about it, if you can control it and do it in a good way, mm-hmm. then you can really make things happen and how quickly things are happening. Yeah, um, it's, that's right. Know, it's pretty awful. Well, and so this kind of takes us into two, and I, I, I do have some personal questions to ask you toward the end, because I, I, of course, want to have everybody know more about you. And we're learning so much already, but we're, we'll get into it too. But you're talking about, a lot of, you know, I think experience can be a central theme we're talking about here too, and memories and, but just, um, not just, I, I, I just feel like so many people, especially if they don't work in the events industry, don't really think about events, as you mentioned, that there, there's, there's psychology, there's chemical exchanges happening there where you're actually impacting how someone thinks and feels. And I think this probably segues nicely. I know you're working on some stuff right now that probably translate right into there. So tell us what you're working on right now, as far as, as far as events right now are looking and, and what your perspective is on them. It, it occurred to me that we're at an inflection point in the event industry, but I think what we're seeing, you know, we've been through this awful downslide where people all of a sudden appreciate events because they have not been able to go to them. And you're seeing the rise of the, of the, of the, of the digital platform. You're seeing all these things that are trying to emulate the, the face-to-face event. And I see what's happening though now after you know 20 months, whatever number of months we're doing in this, that we're in the on the verge of a great in, event industry renaissance. Mm. That I think from the point of view of, you know, we've hit the bottom, but in every sort of downturn, in every type of crisis comes opportunity. Yep. And and you're gonna you're seeing that now. And I was trying to go through where I see that happening. And, mm-hmm. and and what I have found that you know, one thing that that people really need to know is that there is a need for a human gathering. We teach, we learn, we socialize, all that kind of stuff. And so I think that that not only is it going to be a gold mine that's going to happen, uh, but it's also going to be a major uh, a way to think. And so the first thing that I'm finding is that event thinking is going to permeate everything from just managing the act of employees going to work. To managing a senior a senior center in a sense. Yes, yeah. It, 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 it's it's about this temporary moment that ha- that happened. That events are about the temporary moment. You never want to de- decorate your house like you're you're having a party because you wouldn't get sick of having all that those balloons <laughs> around. And so you want like nice solid marble and things like that. But when you do it temporary event thinking, it's it transports you for the moment. And so even when people are coming back to the office now, event organizers are using that as a way to to encourage people to come back and to celebrate that they're coming back. And, and I see that, that that's a whole area of thinking and methodology. Mm-hmm. Remote work is changing everything. And this it's creating a whole new sort of type of events. I, my mother was in a, um, a memory unit for Alzheimer's, which is awful. But yeah. it was fun, interesting to see the camp directors at the Alzheimer clinic trying to get everybody to do stuff because they yeah. have to fill the day. You know, they, and so event organizers are really like camp counselors in one, in one sense. Yeah. And this event thinking is going to become more and more important. And, you know, and everything's going to get involved in that. And you're going to see more catering will get involved in in those Mm. kinds of things and gifting and experiential agencies to make it so that when people come back, they remember, 
oh my God, this is the first day back. And every quarter we're going to come do something. Let's say. I love, oh my gosh. I, you are just speaking music to my ears right now because I do feel like I, everyone kind of just wants everything to go back to normal. Like, okay, if we tell you, yes, you're going to come back to the office. Um, they don't treat it like the first day of school. To me, I always think back to like when, and you know, again, we're, we're kind of in that season right now. A lot of kids did just go back to school with all the ins and outs that that is uh, happening right now with a global pandemic going on and everything. But um, first day of school is always this like the super high, you know, like you said, there's serotonin going on. It's like, woo, okay, I'm, you know, going to go see some friends that I haven't seen for a while. It feels special. It doesn't feel like just any other day I'm going in. And I think that's where so many people miss the opportunity to not make that a regular thing, to, to not turn that into, a, you know, let, let's capitalize on that feeling more often than just like, say, once a year or, you know, making it just about a certain day. But oh. but like you said, they're welcoming people back. Why not make that, you know, use the games, use the food, because God knows that food can speak to anybody just about. But, you know, just add that little bit of special sprinkle to it that makes it feel like, hey, I am in a cool event, not just an everyday kind of thing. Right. That, I can't get excited about. Totally. But you know, imagine the down, you know, you have these big expectations. You're going to the office for the first time mm -hmm. and you get there and nothing's happening. If you, it's like a downer. So yeah. smart business com companies are, are definitely doing exactly what you said is capitalizing on that. And event organizers are now managing that process and they're turning those the remote working because people are going to do more and more remote working into when they do come to the office and get together on a regular basis into event thinking. Yes. And, and it makes it more fun and it also makes it better for the company and you sell more stuff and you, and it's more effective. So such a good point too. And, and especially thinking there are a lot of companies that are not necessarily going to go back to the office. They're going to continue to be primarily remote, at least for the foreseeable future. But you talk about that first day for a fully remote employee. That's a big challenge. You don't have the big ge geographical, physical location to make some big splash. You've got to do it virtually. And so, man, I can see a lot so of them probably lot, wanting. Yeah, there's a lot of, you know, using digital tools and face-to-face -face tools. Yeah. On different tracks now. I don't think that it's all about hybrid. I think mm -hmm. it's about using them appropriately when, when it works. Yeah, and for I sure. I think you're going to see that. The other thing that, I, that I'm seeing, you know, I'm in the trade show side of the business and there's there's a lot of event organizers that are going um, under because they don't have the capital to do things. But what's interesting is that the niche that, that they're serving are not going under. Mm -hmm. So there's a gold rush that's going on to capture those niches. A lot of people that were laid off from the big companies are saying, oh, I can do that. And they're starting up new events. Yeah. You're seeing a whole group of people that are, are looking uh, to this gold rush of abandoned niches. And they're also finding new niches. Mm -hmm. And they're serving them with events. For example, the other day I was at a conference and somebody said, oh, you know, we're going to put a conference together of all the dispatchers that work in all the different companies from the, in the, in, uh, in, in, for police and fire and everything else. Wow. And that dispatching he says, oh my God, that's a whole nother niche of people. And when you get a niche defined, they want to get together. So there's this whole thing about that's why I say that, you know, we're in the renaissance of the event industry because new things are going to be happening. Yeah. Well, and oh God, I love that you brought that up. I actually know some people who work in dispatch too. Um, and I, I, they've got their own, every, every one of these groups, any one of these niches has all these commonalities that only they can relate to, but you can bring them together just to talk about that. And that's, that's the common ground where now you have that launching pad for that event. And you're so right where I think, um, we're, we're, seeing people tap into that filing and realizing, hey, we this can get pretty micro, but it can yeah. still have huge impact. And maybe because it's so micro and not like on this, oh, well, we better just invite tens of thousands of people, but instead to just meet the needs of that one niche group can yeah, have right. a huge lasting impact yeah. for those experiences. Yeah. The other thing that we found that is also encouraging me on this whole thing is that yet the whole influencer marketing we always think is all about the Kardashians. I actually uh -huh. was thinking about, I was told, told about this guy that, that, that is doing a, a social media for something called, um, it is called, uh, Fabcon, I think it's called Fabcon, uh -huh. <laughs> but you think it's about fabulosity and all that. It's about welders and fabricators. Oh. And so they all have their own influencers and their own Instagrams and they're all really cool kick-ass welders. That yeah. Are, you know, Padded up, and you know they're doing their like welding stuff, and so those are people also that are superstars in those industries. So people are using event um, uh, influencer marketing to to capture these small niches too, micro influencers. And I yes. think that's another reason to say that you know we're doing microcosms of the big things that you see in the consumer world. Well, and 
you know, again, you're, you're giving such good insight to anyone who's listening or watching this, uh, and realizing that you don't have to be a marketer to want to go to an event. And I think a lot of us, particularly in marketing, we get, tend to get real myopic to think, oh, well, I've got to put on an event that only others, only other marketers would appreciate. Oh, heck no. I mean, there's, there's, of course, yes, creators and marketers out there are real used to these events, but like you said, there's all these other groups of people that, um, we all know we probably interact with them every single day. And if you were to say, Hey, if we could put together an event that you could go to, you know, electricians or, you know, garbage collectors, uh, anything like that, or, or janitorial or camp counselors, uh, Hey, would you like to go to an event that is just for people like you that work in the same, they'd be like, yes, I would love to congregate with my people. Do you know, one of the biggest events in the, the world is called the cement show. And it's in oh. Vegas, and it's all the people in the cement business. Wow! It's, so you're thinking that every, we don't have to. The glamour is everywhere. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, you can turn anything into glamour, and people want to gather no matter who they are. So that's so that's another another thing that I realize is one of the reasons that this we're in the renaissance because people are realizing, especially you know, birds of a feather want to flock together, mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter. And organizers need to help it along a little bit so that it's not just a boring, you know, it's just a boring thing. Yeah. Um, well, and you're, you're, you're look at it that way too. Event planners, we're, we're providing a service, um, by putting that platform or that space or that instance together that just gives them, can they just click on a link or go through a door and now they're in that space. You helped make that happen. And like you said, that's that lasting memory too, where they're gonna be like, I wouldn't have been able to congregate with my birds of a feather. Had you not put this together for me? I just yeah. rhymed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're right. You're a rhymer. See, <laughs> we, we have all sorts of uh, new things that we can figure out uh, that's right. in, in the way we talk. We'll be that's it's kind of like you just created the birth of rapping. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear me rap. That was literally the limit I can do, everybody. Uh okay. I'm a, I'm more of a Dr. Seuss person myself, okay. where it's you know, it's just uh redfish, bluefish, and all that stuff. But uh but yeah, but you're right. I mean, and again, thinking about all that, you, you talked about musicians coming full circle to that, but also, you know, just there's so many groups out there that uh they can get together and I can just come and watch and enjoy their talent yeah. where I'm where I'm lacking. <laughs> So, so the, the third thing that I see happening to support this idea that we're in a great renaissance is that that you're having um, cities are going to change. This whole remote working has changed something. So there's been a lot of talk about how cities and offices are going to be hum- becoming hubs for socializing, learning, and entertainment. The biggest thing that's happened in the rebirth of cities after something happens is that uh, it changes for the positive. Like the Industrial mm-hmm. Revolution, all the big businesses left uh, after the Industrial Revolution, they left cities. And what happened to those buildings? They were turned into great condos and great, you know, great uh, studios and fun places to live. And it's the cool, they're the coolest places in New York. So I think you're going to see a lot of that. And that translates into events in many mm-hmm. cases. Also, I think what's going to happen is that these empty spaces that are happening are going to become basically exhibition halls for industries that are permanent. But you're going to have to make them so they change. So a, a company is going to have a trade show booth uh, with all the other companies in their field, and they're going to be competing. And that's going to be from a remote worker point of view. They won't go to their office. They'll go to this trade show booth to gather, to meet customers and things like that. And it's going to be really cool and dynamic. But you know, the fourth floor of, uh, of the Pan Am building will be the place that the, uh, that the cement guys meet, you know, that type of that's thing. Right. So that's right. You're going to see more and more of that. And it's going to, ha- it's going to, be also good for the event ecosystem. How do you, um, David, I want to ask you too. So I we're talking about like cities and metropolis and stuff like that, but uh, when it comes to like more rural communities, maybe smaller towns, how do you see them kind of figuring into that, that, that Renaissance that's coming and it, will those strictly be limited to virtual? Do you think, or do you think we might see some more micro, um, you know, events that transform those communities or or, are sprouting up in, in rural areas? I think you're going to see a lot more, I actually got. I actually was discussing the idea of doing trade show tourism because all of a sudden you've said, you know, maybe I want to be a welder, and then I'd like to go to the welding conference. I would never have thought about going to the welding conference, but that opens up my mind to a whole different thing. Or totally. So there's there's ways that you're going to see conferences all around. I also think you're going to see micro smaller cities are going to become a place where um, big trade shows are going to happen because it gets makes you to feel like you're you're owning the town as opposed to mm-hmm. a big city. So there's yeah. going to be a little bit of a, of a, of a you know, both, both sides happening. Uh, yeah. I think that's going to definitely work. Awesome. Um, the other thing that I think is going to happen is that 
uh, you know how in recipes, everybody wants to deconstruct the recipes. Mm -hmm. Well, people want to deconstruct, deconstruct events now. So these yeah. huge events are going to be coming lots of smaller, intimate events. Mm -hmm. And people are going want to, you know, divide up in, in the birds of a feather in their own industry, like all the communications people, all the marketing people, all the, you know, all the, all the uh, HR people, you're going to see more and more of that. So these big, huge events are going to be smaller with a bigger envelope, maybe, but they're going to be smaller. So there'll be more of this smaller events because people ultimately want intimacy. Yes. Because you know how you go to a big, huge event for 10,000 people and you never get to talk to anybody. Yeah. Well, that's a great point. Like I'm actually, I'm going to attend a virtual conference. It's for marketers. Um, but, uh, I know there's going to be tons of people there, thousands of people attending, but I'm already planning. Like I know a couple other people who are also attending virtually and we're just going to plan our own virtual little space where we can be like, okay, why don't you go to that one, go to that session. I'll go to this session. Let's come back and compare notes and talk about what we got out of it because, you know, yes, we can get the stuff on demand later, but we want that little space where you're going to be like, let's talk, let's do some insider chatter about this. This yeah. is really cool. The most successful digital platforms are the ones that break up into smaller groups. Yes. And and you get to know people in a way that you're really, you can't hide uh, in a in a digital um, meeting room. That's because right. Because they go around the room and they say, oh, how about you? And so you got to pay attention to the whole time. So I think that that's really going to be interesting. Um, <laughs> and David, it, sorry, go ahead. You go ahead. But it brings up my fifth point is yes. that- we're in the age of the collaboration artist, I call it. The person that is the facilitator becomes more important than ever because it's you can have all the beautiful gugas and things like that, but if, if nobody knows how to get people, get the girls to dance with the boys at the elementary school or, or junior high school dance, then nothing happens. So I believe that, that the whole idea of being a facilitator and yes. knowing how to connect people is going to be one of these skills that are gonna be beyond valuable. Yes. Thank you for saying that. I actually made that reference to, I think it was just in the last week I was saying, you know how, when you do go to a dance floor and it's a, you know, whether it's at a wedding, we talked about that or, or just at a school dance or something, nobody wants to go first, but it always takes that first person or couple or whatever group that will go out and start dancing. And that makes everyone else feel like, okay, now I can go. Anyone who felt like eh, I need someone to kick this off for me. You're so right that that kind of just a, a catalyst person can can really or get just, things going. Or being, I, I call that event organizers have to become collaboration artists. Yes. Whether they're collaborating on creating the event or they're helping their audience collaborate to talk to each other. Yeah. And, and that to me is the soft skill that is going to become the most valuable thing that you can ever have happen, I think. I love in, that. In events. And, and, it's, and it makes sense. I mean, how many times the great teacher is a collaboration artist? The great um, orchestra leader is the ultimate collaboration. Oh, artist, totally. It. But it, it's how do you orchestrate it in a way, but it doesn't happen by accident. Yeah. That, that, that there are techniques to, to operating, to running a meeting. Most people don't even know how to run a meeting. Uh, and, oh, you're and so right. <laughs> most people, and then people are, that are introverted have to be dealt with differently than people that are extroverted. And that's, that's right. And not, also, and to not treat one group like they're better than the other. Everybody's got value, but that person who can bring them all together and make them feel like they're each important equally. Yep. Yep. For sure. The, well, so David, um, I know, and we're actually, I know we have, a, we're kind of limited on time today too. Okay. And I want to have, have you one back. More. I have one yeah. more though. Bring it. Is, bring this it. This is Let's for you it. guys. Okay. I think that the virtual event platforms are po poised to be one of the most powerful ways to solve problems because they capture the wisdom of the crowd. Mm -hmm. I believe that if you get the right collaboration artist in the right digital platform, you can do the largest brainstormer in the world and, cl and solve things like climate change and oh. everything because it is one of the greatest tools that has, been ever, that has ever been invented in order to capture the wisdom of the crowd so true. Well, and the barrier for entry is less with a virtual event. You literally can get more people in the room, more minds in the room. I Can I just say, um, Hubelo, wouldn't, it would be great if like we were the platform where climate change got solved because of a, a particular meeting we had. I, yeah. I'm, I'm staking our claim right now that we are going to be that platform that they will talk in years to come that we have gained back because we stopped climate change or that we solved it, uh, that they're going to say, and it all began back in a, an event that was hosted in the Hubelo platform. That's and right. David, I'm staking my claim. We have dibs Do on it. that right now. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Um, I know. I, but hey, I'm all about, hey, if we can solve climate change, wherever it happens, let's do that together. But you're right. Virtual events, I think, um, again, just bringing people together that may not have gotten together 
otherwise. But because that barrier to entry is lowered and and made more easy, we can bring those together. But uh, I, I, where can we find more about what you're talking about today with this renaissance of the events industry? Are you going to be publishing um, this somewhere? Yes, I'm publishing an article. I'm starting to talk about it everywhere. And I think it's something where I just want more information for other people. Let Help me do it. Because yeah. I think it's something that we, we have to raise the self-esteem of our industry, uh, mm. which is more important because we've been battered. Uh, and, and we have a whole new group of people coming in to, to take it to the next level. And I think the digital platforms have been the catalyst to do that because you're making us realize that there's a whole lot of other stuff out there that we can do. That we're not limited to a physical event. For sure. No, I challenge accepted. And uh, David, thank you so much too for uh, bringing this to light. And like I said, we, we're, you've given us a lot to talk about and think about and react to. Um, where can we find your information? Like where can we connect with you online uh, to learn more about BizBash and what you're offering? I, well, BizBash.com is our website. Um, I'm avail- I'm a, I'll even give you my email address. How about that? Bring it. I want people to get back to me with their ideas. It's called, it's D Adler, David D Adler at bizbash.com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. I don't know the exact address, but it's David Adler. I'm on Instagram, David Adler one. I'm on Twitter at David Adler. I'm on, I'm, I'm, I even have a, a, a TikTok account, but I don't know what it is, but uh, I think. <laughs> well, that, that's pretty cool. I got to say. TikTok is one of the greatest Ugh. new ways for communicating messages and learning. Uh, well, hubelo has got an account on there too. I'll make sure we find you and let's find each other and, and uh, friend up here. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> we'll do that. And um, Dave, before I do let you go, I did want to ask a couple more personal questions that can give of us course. some insight into you. Um, what are you, uh, everyone seems to be binging stuff sometimes. Some people don't have time to binge things, but I'd love to know, like, is there something special you're listening to, watching or reading right now that's kind of sticking with you? Yeah. You know, one of the things I'm listening to on, on, on Audible is I'm listening to the court a book on the, I don't, I forgot the actual name of it, but it's about on the court of Henry the eighth. And it's, it's, it's an audio book that I'm, re, I'm listening to that talks all about the soft power of how that court of Henry the eighth was, how the people that took care of his bedroom, the people that took care of his, uh, you know, his, his advisors, how he played sports and how he played tennis and how he filled his day. It's so fascinating. It's so interesting. Love um, it. And then what else? Oh, I just watch, I'm, I'm watching um, Billions. I just uh, started watching Billions again. And I love all those shows. I think I, I'll do, I do believe that this whole binge TV is addictive and, and not good for you. Yeah, um, it, becomes, <laughs> it can be bad. <laughs> so, so I have to, I have to watch out for that, especially in a pandemic that you end up like, oh, for sure. about the world. I'm in my own little world. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a good escape momentarily, yeah. but yeah, I, when I, you get I, so much, it's like, whew. I also just got a new puppy, uh, a Sharpay, a miniature Sharpay named Armady. And I named him Armady because I was reading the Thomas Jefferson autobiography, biography, and he had bought brought uh, four puppies from um, France back to uh, the U.S., to Virginia, where I have another house. And he, the name was Armandy. So I named the dog Armandy. So we'll, like, can we see your dog on your Instagram? That's why yeah. we should go follow you. Yes, there's a, has, he has his own Instagram site called... Um, uh, Commander Armandy. Oh, that's so cool. So oh, I, I love pet. I love pets on Instagram. I think I'll they're tell amazing. You, pets, p- puppies are the key to marketing. I never <laughs> been so popular in my life. <laughs> well, it's funny because, uh, even my boss, we were just, we've been on some calls the last week where we've seen people's plus ones, whether that's a baby or a toddler or their, you know, older child or their pet or just something. And, uh, can we just say again, I think with you're talking about the renaissance of events, I think we have a renaissance of experiencing each other online where it's okay to be sharing these other more personal aspects to ourselves. The things and the people and the, and the you know, the loved ones that make up, up who we are, are showing up more. And I, I love that too. So I can't wait to see your puppy. I'm going to go look it up because I think that'll, that'll sh- tell me more about you. Oh my gosh. Yep. You're putting it. Oh, oh, okay. Everybody. Everybody needs to go follow this dog on Instagram. And it's so cute. Oh my gosh, now I want a dog. Well, um, David, thank you so much for taking some time with us today. Um, and and we're going to obviously have this up at our podcast and our live stream. But uh, I am looking forward to seeing and hearing and reading more about the renaissance of the events industry because I think we're going to be part of it. But thank you, you so are. much. Thank you. Yes.